So welcome to Coffee Talk. Um, we are just going to go through the email of the day and I'm going to go through some uh, some things I've bookmarked and answer some questions. And we all will be going and tell what does our schedule say? What does our schedule say? Um, so we'll be going until about, let's see, are we going to go all the way to, I don't know if I'm going to do all 90 minutes, but we'll go as far as we can. So at least an hour from 11.30 to 12.30 and um, possibly a little bit more. So uh, what is Coffee Talk? It's just a time for us to catch up on the news and do a little bit of chatting. This does go all on YouTube, just so everybody knows. Um, so, you know, you, you know that whatever you say and everything's going to go on YouTube. Uh, it will probably be demonetized with a copyright claim because of the Coffee Talk music in the background, but that is fine with me. Yeah. So here we go. Um, we will start out, I'm just going to start out by answering a question that AJ asked here about the books. So I'm actually, as, as anything, go off and talk, you know, no big whoop, you know, discuss. Mm. Uh, so a couple of things I found out today, just, I'm going to kind of go back. I was covering this. I was doing the GraphQL API stuff, which is actually really encouraging. I'm creating a, a GraphQL, um, a curl, a curl GL uh, uh, sort of command function. And I was reading about GraphQL, and oh, pardon me, just realized how how crappy GraphQL. I mean, how crappy React and GraphQL originally were under their licensing. So uh, all I will say is that. Um, React and GraphQL up until 2017 were licensed under um, questionable license uh, through Facebook. And if you want to read about that, uh, you can go read here under it says Road to GraphQL. And I was reminded of it um, because it says right here, I put it in my blog, but it says right here, Although there was some patenting and licensing concerns with GraphQL, these have been resolved to our satisfaction by the relicensing of the reference implementation under MIT and the use of the OWF license for the for the GraphQL uh, specification. I did not until this morning. I didn't know what OWF was. It's apparently the Open Web Foundation, which is founded by uh, some people from Apache originally and Tim O'Reilly from uh, you know O'Reilly Book Publisher. So this is currently the. This is currently where they are, um, where they're licensed GraphQL. So GraphQL and React, as far as licenses are concerned, are fine. But that took a lot of pressure on them to actually release their stuff under open source license, even though they falsely claimed it was open source for m almost five years while people were using it. And there were several companies that chose not to use it because of that. And um, I've got a lot of blog uh, and stuff on Medium about that that discuss it, so I won't talk about it here a lot. Um, but if you want to know, you can you can go down the rabbit hole with me sometime, and we can see. But the bottom line is is that when they first react, re it's called a BSD plus patents license, and what that did is it. I might as well pull it up. <laughs> uh, so React is not open source. This is the the blog that I did, um, which I hope uh, contributed to. I mean, there's a lot of hits on this thing. So I hope that this eventually contributed to them doing the right thing. Um, and so VMware banned React and GraphQL um, because React is not open source software. At least it was not at the time. And here's the here's the blog on it. So um, as you can see, uh, this is this is it was Harold I ran React. Let me go ahead and read it. Um, the music might be too loud to me. I can barely hear it. I ran React up the light flagpole and our position remains the same. Uh, if it is too draconian for use and hence prohibited, though has some similarity to the BSD plus patent grant license that governs the Go package, it is significantly more restrictive in that the React license terminates automatically without notice upon VMware's initiation of any patent assertion at all against Facebook. So this is VMware deciding whether they can use React and Go. They decided Go was a Go. <laughs> and uh, BSD patent plus patent, which is um, the license that Go is released under, was fine. That just says you also get patent rights. So 
Um, but Facebook tried to do the same thing, and then they put a trailer onto it that they didn't tell anybody about. And the trailer said that if you ever sued them for any reason they deemed, you know, for any reason, that they would withdraw the license from you. So, so if you were a competitor of Facebook and for some reason sued them, they would withdraw immediately withdraw their license from you and you couldn't use the software anymore. That is not open source software. That is not anywhere close to the definition of open source. And yet they, they, they got millions of people, if not thousands, if not millions, of people to adopt React and to adopt GraphQL. And so this became a really, really, really big deal. And um, uh, so Facebook just announced that it will release re 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 And this really pissed me off because I, I was following OpenG uh, GraphQL, which was really cool. And I mean, you know, I don't like Facebook, but I, but GraphQL is, the idea of GraphQL is pretty, pretty awesome. Uh, React, not so much. React is kind of broken. The idea of a reactive collection of components is not new and that was in polymer and a bunch of other things so you know they just jammed things together so i you know my feeling on react i hate it but the point is is that they tried to cram this thing out into the world get everybody to adopt it protect themselves permanently against any kind of lawsuit and from anybody who used their software and dominate the world without telling anybody you know they'll say oh we were we didn't say we didn't say <laughs> So, you know, it's just, it's just crazy. So this is, if anybody wants to know why I initially am like so bent out of shape about React, it's because of this. So because of stuff like this, uh, you know, they've set their, they set the stage for being continually un mistrusted by everybody, but particularly the open source world. So it wasn't until uh, the Apache Foundation, and I, I don't remember the exact words, um, I... Let's see here. There, here it is. Update. The Apache Foundation will also not allow this. So this came out, and within about two weeks, Facebook caved and said, fine, we'll re-release everything under an actual open source license. Facebook won't change React.js license despite the Apache developer pain. So this is, they, so if you were an Apache, this is, I'm just going to read it. Facebook decided to stick with its preferred version of the BSD license despite the Apache Foundation sin binning it for any future projects. That means that if you worked on any project with this license, including React or GraphQL, GraphQL wasn't out then, I don't think, that, yeah, they are totally vile. If you worked for any of these companies, if you were a developer on any of those pro Facebook projects, you were banned from any project under the Apache Foundation because you had participated in this other license. So Facebook's BST plus patents license earned the black mark because the foundation felt it, quote, includes a specification of a patents file that passes along risk to downstream consumers of our software imbalanced in favor of the licensor, not the licensee, thereby violating our Apache legal policy of being a universal donor. In other words, fuck you, Facebook. You decided to make a non-open source license and call it that. And we're calling you out on that in the nicest politically correct words we can. So Apache's decision became a problem facing React's Facebook's React UI building JavaScript library is widely is is widely used by projects. Developers are therefore faced with disentangling React if they want to stay on the right side of the TNCs. In other words, if you used Apache software or Apache Foundation stuff, or if you were a developer for the Apache Foundation, you had to disentangle React and could not use it anymore because the license was evil. Uh, developers who didn't fancy the work therefore kicked off a GitHub thread calling for Facebook to change React's license. Now, I'd been calling for this for like three years before. In fact, that's this the original date of this post is like way, way, well, it, to me, it was like web time, so it was 2016. So by 2017, they finally came around. Not listed on the OSI approved list. Shared concerns about React. This is me documenting all this. Um, and... Um, PWAs over React. I mean, these are all valid arguments against React besides the license. So, um, but despite this situation, developer was facing a painful Facebook engineering director. Adam Wolf explained that the social network won't be changing anything. So this is, this is where Facebook really, really earned their shithead status. Okay. This is when Facebook said to everybody, oh, 
We don't care what the Apache Foundation says. We don't care about this whole entire GitHub thread that's against us telling us to do the right thing. We don't care about what you developers think. We're going to do our own thing anyway. And they permanently established themselves as the new Microsoft. In other words, the new 90s evil Microsoft. I mean, this is insane. This was like, you know, this is this is some some serious stuff that they did here. And and so the really funny thing is, is that they caved within like three days after this. <laughs> They're like, we've changed our mind. We actually were wrong on that. I wonder what I wonder who got called out on that over at Facebook. Wolf asserts that Facebook adores open source, yeah, bullshit, and likes to give a good as good as it gets, but says our business has become successful. We've become a large target for meritless patent litigation that sucks up time and money. Probably true. Probably true. I mean, the patent litigation was insane at that time. There were people on the open source teams who were like suing big companies because they weren't in compliance with, G open, with GPL too. It was patent, tra patent craziness. Facebook could, would have walked away from the source, he says, but instead decided to add a clear patent grant when we released software again under the BSD clause uh, creating what has come known as the BSD plus patents license. The patent grant says that if you're going to use the software we've, we've, we've released under it, you lose the patent license from us if you sue us for patent infringement. So, and that's a pretty broad thing. You mean if you sue them for any kind of patent infringement, you lose everything. You can't use any of their software. And no company wants that, wants that risk. And there's no lawyer that's going to go for that risk. Well said, Facebook believes that this license was widely, were, that if the license were widely adopted, it could actually reduce merit litigation from adopters. The problem is they just didn't even ask a fucking lawyer about it. I mean, all the lawyers for VMware and everywhere else are like, no, no, that's not how this license would be interpreted. In fact, there's a, there's a, there's a software patents. I know they're so weird, but I was like, there's actually a lawyer that I read who is a patent lawyer and he was like no this is bad this is really bad and he, some of the, one of the ones i link from the blog here the react is not open source um, and that's when i really 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 knew because i i didn't want to form this opinion casually um and so this is it right here the el camino legal llc is the um uh yeah so i think that's the one where is he i mean this is so many years ago <laughs> like three years ago that's deep. So that what's their strategy? Yeah, no, it's, it's it's in this in this case I just think I just think they were clueless. I really do. I don't they were evil, but I don't think that they meant to be as evil as they ended up being. The the I would say was this was more of a clueless thing than anything because they didn't actually check with a team of lawyers about the new license that they invented. They didn't ask if this was going to hold up under open source. They didn't go to the open source committee and ask them if they were going to be doing, you know, open source stuff. They didn't, they didn't check with anybody. And so they released it anyway. Then they, then everyone's like, no, this isn't open source. We got all our lawyers are telling us we can't use it. And, and then so we, they say, you know, you guys really need to change your license. We love you. And you should do it. That's what GitHub was. And they're like, no, 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 you don't understand. Everyone needs to do what we are doing. That's the Facebook way, right? Everyone needs to be us. It's this absolute hubris, this like Zuckerberg saying, yeah, we've made some mistakes, but we're also, you know, championing some things that none of y'all can even comprehend because we are so much better than you. I mean, that's that's the Facebook hubris. They just they have no real intent of fixing things or being a good player because they think that they can be the leader without being a team player. And in this case, they didn't even ask a lawyer team what was up. And so React got released and everybody did it. And then everybody, I'm like, no, we're not touching that thing. And then, and, and then GraphQL came out I'm like, damn it, this thing is really great. Why can't we use it? And then they all caved in 2017. So in 2017, they, they caved. So um, after VMware ba banned it, uh, Facebook finally announced on September 22nd, 2017, that it would re-release React under MIT, the, one of the more permissive licenses. And they also did the same thing eventually with GraphQL. Now, they did not release the patents. And so everybody was really scared because they were afraid that they were still holding on to internal patents because they did not do the same thing for GraphQL. Okay. So this is where this came up because this morning when I was reading about the GraphQL thing, I was like, oh, I don't know, man. That sounds pretty scary. But I'm going to go with GitLab on this because I trust them as a company. They're pretty damn awesome. And so I'm like, okay, so they decided to trust GraphQL. So they released another OWF license, which is important because GraphQL is not software. 
Um, graph, the, you know, GraphQL uh, J.js is a reference implementation of it, but GraphQL itself is just a specification, just a piece of paper with writing on it. And they can't release that under Creative Commons because Creative Commons is you know, different. That's for copyright material that is like fiction and stuff like that. So I th this is the first. So this morning is the first time I learned about the Open Web Foundation license, which um, is the one that GraphQL ultimately was released under. So. Uh, the reference implementations are MIT. That means the job open grab, you know, the JavaScript version is MIT. But the specification itself has been released under OWF, and the OWF has itself come under fire for not being an IETF player. And IETF is the big old, you know, Internet Engineering Task Force provider out there, the big old standards body. But a lot of a lot of people are are just done with some of those standards bodies because of some of the stuff that they do. By the way, guys, it will uh, coffee talk is is going to include the dishes um, a lot of times. We're going to try to avoid that in the future by doing dishes the night before. My wife and I are going to do them tonight, the night before, so you don't hear them. But you'll hear you'll, you'll hear you know coffee. You'll hear you'll hear kitchen noises today. So, so why does all this matter to you? Why does all of this matter to you? This matters to you because you need to really be aware of the software you're using as a software developer. If you choose to do software development, you need to be really clear about the licenses of the stuff that you're working on because you can become tainted, it's called. If you work on certain software under certain conditions, there are some companies, depending on what companies you want to work for, that won't hire you or they won't work with you because you have worked on a similar project that was open source and could be, you know, it's, it's just a gray area legally. And even though there, you might think it's okay, the lawyers in the company you want to work for might say, no, man, you're tainted. You've, you've worked on this thing. So you don't need to be really paranoid about it, but you definitely, definitely need to know what software can be directly traced to your contributions because of this. And so if you release software, you need to understand how to release it. You should understand all of the licenses. GPL1, I'm sorry, GPL2, GPL3, which are radically different, um, which is the whole topic by itself. Um, MIT, BSD, this Facebook BSD plus patents. If you understand it, you'll be a licensed pro. Um, you know, the, the Apache 2 license, uh, the whatever the fuck license, the public domain. It, it, particularly if you're going for a certification. If you're going for a, a Linux certification, for example, they require you understand all of the licenses. And that's kind of important knowledge to have going into um, a, tech, a tech job of any kind. Uh, there's, a, there's a remarkably large amount of, of technologists who have no idea what the licenses actually mean. And that's super dangerous. And I worked, w working for IBM, you know, we had to be really clear on everything that we ever worked on. So, um, and then we will add to that OWF, which I did not know about until today. So, um, let's move on from that. We have a lot of time for Coffee Talk tonight, but I want to be succinct. But I do believe um, going through this this topic is is, is valuable. Um, it will be tagged in the Coffee Talk, so maybe, maybe somebody else will hear about it. Uh, why else do, does it matter to you? It means you can use GraphQL. That's and that was why I got into this. I was like, well, can I really use GraphQL and not not be sued? Uh, There's a, a lawsuit uh, between Oracle and Google where Oracle won uh, against them, and because because they used the API for Java, which was supposed to be free, and so I don't know where that's at right now. That was a year or two ago. But the point is, is that you can be sued for using an API, uh, even if you're not using code. And I'm not saying you would be, but you 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 might be participating in a project that could be sued and your association with the project could affect your employability with a, with a particular company. So it's nothing to be really terrified of. Just, just know that you need to know your licenses and you need to know what you're doing, uh, particularly in the software world. Um, in the systems administration and DevOps world, um, you don't need to know about that. The Java APIs, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was, a, that was a pretty big deal. That was the first time. I mean, there was a lot of there was a lot of people that were terrified in the Free Software Foundation, uh, or not just there, but just all over, because they it was the first time that an API, uh, use of an API, was protected under copyright, and that is crazy, because they've been saying you can use our API all you want. That meant that I mean they already know that the software behind the engine itself could be copyrighted under, you know, and licensed. I mean that was already covered under law but for them to say writing up how to do a thing which is exactly what graphql is graphql is just an api 
It's just, here's how you should do it. We don't care about how you implement it. This is how it should be done. Now, you can copyright the words of the API. So the document itself, so this is an important distinction when it comes to legal things, and I should probably talk about this for a second. So software is covered under one license, and that's very specifically software, the, le the words of the software. Those things are covered. Uh, written words, yeah, software, yeah, that's exactly what it is, M. Patented software specifications, that's exactly what it is. And they're not, they don't even have to be patented, and that was the thing. They hadn't even been patented. It was just the API. So so up at, for, for the longest time until this Google case, we've had, we've had software that was, you know, the source code was copyrighted and could be licensed. We have had... Um, I know. <laughs> yeah, we've had um, what was the other stuff? We've had fiction works and you know videos and all that stuff. So all the DCMA or DR whatever they are, I forget the name. Um, DCRM, I think. So we've had all of the like traditional like books, you know, writing, fiction, that kind of thing. That's all been a copyright. Uh, and and then oh wow, this is good information. And then we have and then we have the third area which is new, which is APIs. So APIs were already covered under the document. Okay, so this is important. So if you if you had written a document that contained the API, so say let's say the white paper that, that outlined how to do the GraphQL API, that was covered under copyright, like copyright for the words in it. You could not directly produce the words in that thing. But the stuff inside of it, how you word a certain thing, how you state a certain thing, the specification, that was not covered under copyright. And so what we're finding now is that the Supreme Court, the courts are ruling on this saying APIs can be copyrighted, not just their documents and not just the reference implementations. That's, that's software that implements the API. So those two things haven't come so this this is, this is super important i'm really glad fire you've got this information here for us so it says so oral fire says here oral oral argument is expected on march 2020 and a decision by june uh, one procedural note because of the supreme court's ruling on citing cases the lawsuit will not be known as google versus oracle instead since google has asked the supreme court to hear the case after nine years we'll have we'll have to get used to calling the case by its new name what is its new name <laughs> you cut me off. <laughs> What's the new name while I'm drinking coffee? Do you have it? It's not Google versus Oracle anymore, huh? By the way, I think it's Oracle versus Google, isn't it? <laughs> My coffee cup? It's just, it's a, it's an REI cup. I put everything in it. It's nice. You can like attach it to your, to your backpack and put whatever you want in it. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry for eating in your ear, guys. Eating my walnuts. Oh, really? They changed it. Interesting. That's super interesting. Pardon me, all kinds of funny noises. Um, so yeah. Um, that is a thing. So let's move on to some other news, maybe. Um, we still have a few minutes left. So a half hour about. Um, Google versus Oracle America. Previous name, Oracle America Inc. versus Google in lower courts. Great. Mm, pardon me. Drank too fast. So that's super important. In that case, if that comes through, this is why you're interested in GraphQL. It's also why I think the OWF license is kind of intriguing because it's possible that the OWF license specifically targets the licensing of APIs. And... If that's true, whether or not um, you can sue over that, basically an API is a different copyright, a different license. Uh, we have something to do about that, and the fact that 
uh, GraphQL was a little bit proactive in saying, hey, we're going to release it under OWF, might be a good sign. I mean, that might mean that Facebook is, is playing nice with, with GraphQL, which I think they kind of got bludgeoned into doing. <laughs> I don't, again, I don't think... I mean, if, at first they were like, no, -uh, our license is fine. It's good. Everybody should use it. And they're like, no, your license sucks. And they're like, uh-uh. Like, no, your license sucks. And then somebody else says, no, your license sucks. Like, fine. Okay. Here you go. <laughs> so I'm going to take a drink here and then I'm going to switch gears to some other news. Mm. I'm just going to zip through the news real quick. A um, bunch of stuff that's come in. So, uh, Go 1.14 was released. Uh, it's had quite a bit of problems um, with uh, performance, and some some actually some old implementations on ARM have had uh, problems. Uh, that's all I'm going to say about that. You can go read about that. Uh, 1.13 was the Go release to really, really, really get your you know head around. That was the one that changed for to modules. So. Um, if you're learning Go, why do you care? Okay, so I'm always about why do you care? You care because Go 1.13 is the most important Go release in five or six years. And it moved to the modules platform, so you need to find material about Go 1.14. The book that I recommend in my beginner books does not cover that, and there is currently no book that I know of that does. If anybody finds one, let me know. It's actually an extremely complicated topic, of, and it needs to be covered, but... And I imagine all the authors are scrambling to do so. But there currently is nothing that covers that. Okay. Let's see what else. Um, lots of errors in Zim gets a package. Uh, hey, my rent got paid. Yay. Um, so rent can go into receipts. Uh, Sego. These are, um, the, man, there's a lot of mail that came in this morning. I, this is not the stuff I was planning on covering. Um, this All this stuff, by the way, is coming from the GoNuts mailing list. I like to keep tabs on what's going on in the Go community, and I suggest you follow mailing lists for things that you're interested in, as well as creating uh, Google Alerts. Um, I wish there was another service besides Google that provided that. Um, guide to Data Attributes plus Defining CSS4. Hmm, this is interesting. Let's look at this. Um, and let's see here. Let's define CSS4. CSS4 should be a thing. is a hot button issue right now. So it's not a thing yet. I'm not going to read about it. A complete guide to data attributes. I love data attributes. Uh, data attributes are, are attributes are the key equals value pairs within the HTML elements and particularly the first element, the opening tag. And um, they can be very useful. You can pass all kinds of interesting th things in there. Um, so this is probably worth a read. Uh, Chris Coyer is awesome, if I'm saying his name right. Um, he has done some really amazing writing. Um, I really, really love pretty much everything he has to say. <laughs> so I suggest strongly you like follow him wherever you can find him. Um, this is a document I'm definitely going to read all the way through, so I'm going to put that there. Um, he talks about uh, data. Data. Here we go. So a data attribute is any attribute that has data dash, and they are uh, special because they allow you to provide any kind of attribute that you want of any kind. So you can pass in data to things um, and use it pretty pretty amazingly. So can you can you use the data attribute alone? Uh, it's probably not going to hurt anything, but you won't get the JavaScript API we'll cover in the next guide. So uh, it's going to talk to you about how you can pass data in your HTML, uh, which is sometimes nice because if sometimes you're converting your HTML from a document using Pandoc or some other static site generator, and you want to you want to not necessarily put a whole YAML file and use a whole template for it and everything. You might want to just pass you know have some of some of the data converted into data objects. Um, actually, one th I, there's a there's a library I have never finished called Muhaha, which lets you put data elements around spans, and then those spans will 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 retype themselves as if a ghost writer were writing it. I was like, I want to do a bunch of Muhaha um, 
data tags all over in my blog so people would be reading it and all of a sudden it would just start to retype. I think that'd be really fun. So um, starting with data attributes. Um, so there you go. You can just select data attributes. You can use them as a, as a way to, to pick things. So, so that's definitely worth a read. I've got a bookmark on it and I'm going to go back to that. Next year, it'll be renamed Google versus Oracle, a Disney Microsoft venture. <laughs> no, I don't know, man. Uh, let's see. 200, 200, 2021 reasons to use Clubhouse I.O. Not interested. Making things better. Refining technical possibilities of CSS. I would. That's good. Browse old web pages the new way with virtual browsers. What? What's that about? A virtual browser? What is a virtual browser? Oldweb.today, this is news. I'm, you're finding out about it with me. I'm a little scared of this. Oh my gosh, why would I ever go back to Netscape 3.0? Are you seeing this? <laughs> All right, we're going to see how good my site would look in 1998. <laughs> Surf the old. I'm a, I'm a little scared. Wait, what's going on here? What's happening? Did they put a container inside of an ASM? A 38 users ahead of me. I'm not waiting for an empty slot for 38 users. This looks intriguing, though. This is kind of fun. I'm glad we got this. I got a bookmark. Right? I'm a bookmark. You, you a book bookmarks. That's cool. Apparently, they've got old browsers that you can go browse the web with. They probably they should probably combine that with the web archiver. Because if you because if you combine it with the archiver, you can like really see all kinds of stuff. Although my eyes are burning out. What do they not have dark reader? How come my dark reader is off? I I just, I didn't turn it off. Hmm. Hmm. Twenty users ahead. Wait, do I have a, what is that right there? Is that, is that because my thing's not working? It is, oh, okay, bad streamer, bad streamer, bad streamer, Rob. <laughs> I want a studio so bad, can I just say? Like a room instead of the front room. Oh wait, this one's now, this one's like messed up now. All we're, there's still 20 users ahead of me, I'm giving up on this. In five, four, <laughs> it's not worth waiting around for. Um, what do you think? Should we wait for it some more still? Should we should we wait some more? I don't know. Should we not wait? Okay. 23 users? What? I, I okay. How did somebody else get ahead of me? Fine. Well, I think it's fun. I will come back to you another time. Uh, I bookmarked you. Find a Jeb job, uh, job through Vettery. Not so interested in that. Uh, the good old button. You should not use the button element, by the way. You should use like a link and make the link look like a button so it works in links. How to create a diagonal layout in CSS. That looks pretty fun. I mean, front end, this front end news, this newsletter, if you're not subscribed to the front end newsletter and do anything with web, you should really subscribe. It's actually really good. It has a lot of sponsorship in it. But I mean, there's some stuff in here that's, you know, kind of pandering stuff that I might not like because it is web and the web community in general kind of rubs me the wrong way a lot of times except for Chris Chris is like a rock star um, and everything else is kind of here here it is a Cooper press publication curated by Chris Brandick Trick and Peter Cooper in uh where are they? They're in the United Kingdom. Yet again, something fantastic comes out of the United Kingdom. I can't tell you. I mean, I shot a dollar every time. I'd have like a hundred dollars. I hear about something good coming out of the UK. Site seems sketchy. Why would you even need to wait? Probably because they're loading a, they're loading a container that's talking to Canvas probably over some sort of streaming. And that's what I have a feeling is what they're doing. So, um, that's how I would do it anyway. So get rid of these. Oh, I need to sit up with better posture. Excuse my, like, reorganization of 
the limbs. Did you guys do your meditation today? <laughs> today was such a good day. I'm having such a good day today. I just want to say. Do not know why. Just a great day. So, uh, friend in focus, you can go in my past weekly newses. The rest of this is junk, junk. Not junk, but Twitch. Oh, yeah, that's right. I got to fix my Twitch export. I'll do that later. Uh, I have a, I have a new bill. Well, okay. I should probably keep that. Um, this is new. I did not read this one, so I'm kind of reading it with you. I read, I, I pre-read a bunch of other ones though. How much time I got? 214. Let's see. We'll go to 1230. North Carolina hotbed for military technology needs. Um... North Carolina is well positioned to capitalize on economic growth. The research triangle, the um, you know, like Raleigh in that area, Durham, is uh, still really, really highly re regarded. So, if you want a job there, it's actually a really nice area to live too. Hmm. Turn some music on. Let's see, Raleigh's East Coast made easy campaign unveiled for South by Southwest. Are they going to host South by Southwest? In Raleigh? I might go. I can drive to there. Well, I can drive to any of them. <laughs> I've driven across the country several times. Raleigh's East Coast made easy campaign unveiled for upcoming South... Hmm... For this year's South by Southwest Interactive Trade Show in Austin, I was gonna say, because this is usually an Austin thing. Oh, I see. It's just like marketing. It's like, hey, come to Raleigh, and they're advertising. Uh, yeah. Not. Why did I click on that? Because I didn't know what it was. Um. Raleigh's just going to be, let's see, Tesla autopilot distracted driver causes fatal crash. Um, yes, this was in the news recently. We watched a little bit of this last night. Uh, NCSU lands lead role in federal AI apprenticeship programs. Hmm. North, North Carolina. NC State, I got to say, they're a good school. Um, we have, I have a student here who could go anywhere he wants, you know, perfect scores on his ACTs and not perfect, but on his S, uh, AP test. And he did a lot of research and he, he's concluded that's the best state, uh, the best school for electronics, NC State. So, um, reports Panasonic Tesla to scrap solar panel partnership. Oh, interesting. Yep, well, that's good for that. I mean, there's not really anything to keep in this. So I'm sorry, I, normally that kind of, that's the kind of thing I would filter before I, I brought it to Coffee Talk. Um, so these other things have stuff in them. That's why I, I left them. I pre, kind of pre-looked pre at them. Um, let's see here. Same thing, same thing. Oh, the Dow tumbling. I remember why I kept this. Lab-grown diamonds, that's kind of cool. Um, all right, so Expedia is cutting 12% of its workforce. So there continues to be a bunch of like software-driven companies that are dropping people like crazy. So this goes with the rest of the news that, they, that we are definitely in a software bubble and that the bubble is bursting and that the economy for software developers is bad. Why do you care? You care because if you're trying to decide what area of tech to go into right now, software development is the wrong choice. I mean, for right now. I mean, it's never a bad idea to learn how to code and learn how to do software development. It's very, very empowering. But if you want a job, the fastest jobs right now are cybersecurity and operations. And the current economy is not hiring developers. At least not... not it's, there's always going to be places you can get a job. This is a very big generalization. But... But the indicators seem to be that the software market right now is a little 
you know, it's waning a little bit. There will always be a drought of, ta- of good talent. So if you're, you know, and that means you're just going to have to try harder. You're going to become more senior as a software developer if you're going to try to go for a job in software. Um, otherwise, you know, shoot for the cybersecurity jobs and the hacking jobs and the and those um, kinds of things uh, because those are those are big on the upswing. Yeah, operations jobs and AI stuff, but AI is kind of software developer too. So, uh, you know, data science and that kind of thing. So that's why I care. Um, that's just my impression. A lot of this stuff is my personal impression, but it's based on, you know, seeing a pattern in all of the communication that's coming across. There are YouTube channels of programmers looking for jobs, documenting their interviews, interview sites, then rejections. Yep, I imagine there are lots of them. Um, and I thank you for bringing that up, Zeros. Um, you want to research all of that. It is. I actually think getting a software job is one of the hardest to, to do of all. And I talked about this at length yesterday. So... Uh, if you want to get all the details on that, go look up Coffee Talk from yesterday. But um, so the the software application process is much more rigorous, I feel like, than the systems administration, the SREs, and the cybersecurity. And I don't know why that is other than to say I have a feeling it's because it requires you to prove how smart you are a lot more. For no, some dumb reason, I don't know why. So... Um, I, I mean, I should probably disclose my, my preference is to be a rock star as a systems administrator or as, you know, an SRE or something and write, you know, some scripts or some automations um, that that are not as involved as a massive application or to put a web front end on something that's normally just a command line thing. I know that sounds weird to hear me say that, but that's something that I, I tend to do as well because making stuff for people who don't use the command line. So... Um, you know, to get a job in cybersecurity or, or ops, you know, you present your certificates, uh, you present your degrees, you show your experience, and it's a lot easier to it's a lot easier to prove your skills. Um, to get a software job, they they need to know that you're you know you got a really good brain for programming, and so they need to see you do some programming, either you know on the whiteboard or you know, on the job, or they need to see a lot of, a lot, a lot, a lot of portfolio profile of you having done a lot of software development. So my impression is that it's harder to get a job in software development. You know, it just, it just is. There's more, there's a lot of jobs in web development though, and those are not going to go away. So anyway, so, but I, I tend to read more stories of people not getting jobs who went to boot camps and got software development things than I do of people getting them and I continue to read like all all sorts of people on Twitter who have got cybersecurity jobs and they got three offers and all this other stuff so that's just my takeaway from it when I'm my radar and that's out there listening to all different kinds of people um is that one of them I'll give it a shot hey welcome to dummy codes welcome to uh I'm turn him up a little bit let me pause him Coffee, I can wait. Coffee, coffee stuff. Coding, that's what we do on this channel. Um, I haven't done some coding in a while. I should probably do that to keep up with my brand. <laughs> keep up with this brand. <laughs> See, this is what happens to streamers, man. I mean, this is why, oh, I want to say, by the way, my schedule is like so awesome. <laughs> So I got up this morning, I followed my schedule, and I got so much more done coding this morning than I've ever gotten done since I started streaming. So I'm I'm happy about that. I think that's why I'm happy because I could feel my coding was really seriously waning with the streaming. I was like, I cannot let my coding go. It's not like I'm going for a coding job, but I want I don't want that skill to get soft. So if you watched my last two videos or my last video, I talked about my personal failure in interviewing as always. Today, I want to talk about just failure in general with interviews. I've been seeing a lot of people. I haven't been seeing a lot of people. I don't know why I started that sentence like that. I'm so sorry I lied. I want to talk about just failing interviews and maybe motivate you guys, maybe not. I don't know why, but here's the thing. Ah, that's what I'm talking about. Okay. Sometimes I start these videos and I completely blank on what I was supposed to be talking about. I don't know how that's possible because I plan these things. He's like, and I just he's like live streaming like his YouTube videos. <laughs> on 
each person I've been working through, each person that I've grown close to in this bootcamp network has been getting a job some way or another. And I am beyond happy for them. You know, I'm beyond- It's like, I don't even want to go here today, but we talked about this yesterday. I'll watch the rest of it a little bit later. Thanks for showing me him. Um, memory is an issue, so I'm going to turn that off. So, ah, the lawyers are- so let me just say um, something that he said just really triggered me um, not to get angry, but just kind of made me think about what I've been saying over and over again is that um, the the jobs, he, he's got people going, yeah, no, that's good. We'll go pull it up again. So he's going to a boot camp. He went to a boot camp, it sounds like, and he has a bunch of friends that are getting jobs and he's not. And I could be oversimplifying it, but the but the problem with boot camps is that's what they are. They're inconsistent. And the reason they're inconsistent, and I talked about this a lot in the coffee talk yesterday, is because people are not learning how to learn. They're not they're they're coming away from it and then they, they don't have extra stuff to show for it. Uh, plus it's a boot camp, so it's already gonna be suspect. There's companies that have hiring policies against boot camp people. Um and and, and there's a lot of people. So 2013 is when boot camps really, really, really exploded. So I think two things are happening. I think all these boot camp people are now like on the market looking for jobs. And you have the economy, you know, the tech economy kind of waning. And you have the, the whole Silicon Valley environments like, no, nope, we're just going to hire 10x programmers. Because if they can hire a single 10x programmer, they can still pay, you know, half if not less money for one of them than they can for a bunch of beginners. And I'm not saying you should be depressed by that, but but that is the state of affairs. And if you are going up against a veteran who's been coding forever, you're, you're going to have a hard time because software development includes a lot of experience. You really need a lot of experience making things so you can prove that you have the, not just the, the skill to write code, but you have the overall design architecture in your head you have good design patterns and stuff and so one of the things that i would suggest with that is to make sure that you supplement your you know the skill of learning how to code with things like i think it's martin fowler's patterns book so um martin fowler and this is not something that is taught um this isn't even taught in computer science so in fact these are usually people who um, are in corporate corporations who find uh, enterprise patterns of architecture. So Martin Fowler um, is one of the, the greatest writers on this. Um, and if you want to get, if you want to, to like sort of fast track your enterprise knowledge, the knowledge of how to make large systems work and how to architect them and make the pieces fit together, not just how to code it, then you want to look at this. So, so of course, data, data structures and algorithms, those are important too, but they're not nearly as important as enterprise application architecture. And so if you, if you want to become a senior programmer, you need to start understanding these concepts so that either you can talk about them, but better than that, you can actually implement them in projects where you are. Now, this, this is where it gets really frustrating because for you to implement an enterprise pattern or architecture in an open source project, which would normally be the recommendation people would give you, you need to go out and make a GitHub repo or GitLab repo and show your skills and get on some open project, right? Well, even if you got on a big project like, like Babel.js or React or something, they, they have architecture in them, but they are not, even those large software projects are not big enough for you to show that you have knowledge of enterprise pattern architecture. So this is, and this is where it gets kind of interesting because there's really no degree in this that I've found. There's, I, I've never found anybody who's assigning these kinds of books, these enterprise pattern books in, because they don't really fit under computer science, right? And they don't, they, they are software development, but they're bigger than that. They're software architecture, they're enterprise architecture. And so they're just design patterns that kind of, kind of aren't, they're, they're, there's, I've never seen them in a, in a master's program and I've never seen them in a, you know, in a junior computer pro science program. And they definitely aren't in a fucking boot camp. You know, boot camps don't even touch this stuff. They should. Boot camps teach you how to code in rails and you're on your way. 
you know and and that's so people are left to learn this stuff and those who who find ways to pick this up or who come across it on accident or who talk to mentored people who are mentoring from the for the, so you should need you know enterprise patterns even I've, I've known a lot of like professionals who've never even heard of martin fowler and they've been working for 10 years for ibm or wherever you know so um so if if you're going to really compete in the software world, you have to you have to become a 10x programmer, no, a senior software engineer. That's the position. And if and you have to really 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 like software, okay? If you do not like writing code in software and potentially having your whole project thrown in the trash because some other project came along ahead of yours, then this is not the career path for you. If you want to make, you know, web apps and stuff, there's a lot of things you can do there that are not, you know, strictly speaking software engineering so it's a different thing there's always going to be a need for the quick little app for for the middle you know small to medium to big and the projects within the bigger companies there's always going to be web application apps and progressive web apps that are needed but if you want to truly become like a senior software engineer and that's where the real money is that's where the real job growth is then you you need to understand enterprise patterns and you, you need to find opportunities to get educated in that and i don't know of any right now other than the books so this is one of those things where I mean I read all these books on my own when I got when I got my job um, as Nike's internal uh, webmaster, um, and I was able to add these things. So, um, so that is something you might want to consider. Um, uh, Fowler's got a couple books I should probably look into. Uh, he's also one of the guys who wrote a lot about agile, um, and uh, I'm thinking to myself here that I need to to go find some more. Um, books that I can recommend at that level for to help people, you know, move from becoming, uh, you know, junior to mid to senior. And I remember having junior people come in that I had to take care of and I had to kind of help while I was at IBM. And it was so frustrating because they didn't have, I mean, they had great coders and great people, but they didn't have any sense of, you know, like what the what the, you know, subscriber pattern was. They had no idea what it was. So, so I would have to describe it to them and say, okay, well, we're going to, you know, we're going to create a single event, you know, queue, and we're going to have other, other, you know, pieces of software, check that queue regularly, blah, blah, blah. And I'm not talking about any specific implementation. I'm just talking about an approach to how to deliver the software. And it was super frustrating because they were saying, okay, I'm going to do a thing. And sometimes they'd get really excited and they would make something and they would put it out there. And, and I would look at it and I'd be like, dude, no, I mean, I was like, I was, I was so, I was so frustrated because I didn't want to put them down. You know, I was like, dude, this is, this is really good code, but you know, it's, why are you doing this and this and this and this and this? And, 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 uh, you know, in, in my experience, that's, that's always frustrating because you want to help them out. But and at that, at that point, I'm the guy, I was the guy who was like, I'm just going to do it. <laughs> I'm just going to do it. And there's other people out there that are like that. In fact, that that um, that guy from 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 uh, Kama um, that we talked we saw last night is kind of like that. But I mean, I'm not particularly good at all that stuff. I know I know people that are much better than me. So so why do you care about everything I'm saying here? Again, I'm I'm going to keep saying that. Why do you care? You care because if you're going to go into software development, you're going to need to know right now that software development is a challenging field to, to break into. And that if you want to break in, number one, don't call yourself a junior programmer and don't be a junior programmer. Get enough experience that you can just call yourself a software developer. Okay. And once you have that, you can get work. It's going to be harder right now because there's not that much enterprise work out there. It's like going down apparently. I mean, that's my reading of it. I could be wrong, but right now it seems like it's kind of not as much as there was and i believe it's because of the boot camps and, and other things that are kind of glutting the market with people um you know they, they call it the new class you know the, the the people who are now kind of the old school oil workers right and the old school coal workers but now they're software developers so so you have to become at least you know good and then you need to get internships and 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 reach out so that's why you care um if you want to go into the field of software development, you need to automatically add patterns and enterprise architecture to your personal learning path. Because if you don't add it, you're not going to find it. There's nobody else teaching it, as far as I know. If you find them, let me know. Um, and then you're going to be like, well, how do I do that? 
Well, the only way to do that is to simulate these things and to find projects you can make for yourself, uh, such as um, a virtual agent architecture where you would have you know, a singular agent on a machine and then it's plugged into Twitch and plugged into Discord and plugged into Twitter. You can you can simulate these kind of architectures at a small scale. So then you can talk about why you did this thing in an interview. So and this is this is one of the reasons that the virtual agent project is a project at Skillstack that I recommend to everybody when they move on to the Go space. After they get past their web stuff, they move on to the Go backend space and then they can create these these sort of mini enterprise architectures and then they can talk about them intelligently while they're you know while they're being interviewed and not only that they can talk about it as a passion project a passion project is the kind of thing that's really going to sell you because they're going to see wow not only do they know enterprise architecture and can they code and go but or rust or whatever but they also have a lot of passion about this and they did it on their own so that they could learn and they want they made something they really liked and it doesn't have to be a significant thing it can be uh, an agent that talks to Twitter or a bridge that connects Twitter to Discord or to Twitch or whatever. It can be something like that because they just want to see that you've got a sense of like good design sense and that you can do the thing and that you're motivated. And beyond that would be if you did it with a team, if you had two other people or so and they were all helping you because now you can show you're a team player. Um, if you want a software job, that's the kind of project you should be working toward. And then you can go from there. That's a lot of talk, but um, hopefully that'll be useful. Um, let's see here. Uh, man, this stuff comes in so fast. This this whole language ball, I, I did want to show this. So so fuchsia, come, fuchsia is absolute crap. Don't even think about learning fuchsia. Promise me, people. Promise me you will not waste your time with this horrible, horrible operating system. Um, I quite understand their critique. GC sometimes causes me problems. Well, no kidding. So what is Fuchsia? Fuchsia is a programming language that Google is coming out with that is completely and totally designed to get rid of GPL. So it's very clear right now that they are trying to replace Android and that they're going to build a new operating system that's built off of Fuchsia, which is 100% MIT open, like super duper open. And they might not even make it fully open, but they don't want anybody participating who doesn't. The reason I think it's absolute trash is the primary language on the project is C++. And if you don't know why, C++ is a horrible, horrible language to pick for a primary operating system. Go watch Brian Cantrell's video, which I've talked about many times, about, about the failures of object-oriented operating systems. It's called... Is it time for Rust as an operating system? Is it time to rewrite the operating system in Rust? Ryan Cantrell's, is it time to rewrite the operating system in Rust? And and pass forward to the part where he talks about the dark times of the of object-oriented programming and all of the all of the fails to try to write operating systems using, C, using any kind of object-oriented system. So Fuchsia is running smack dab into that wall. Uh, and they have they've decided, decided to do Dart, and it's it's going to totally fail. I'm, I'm just I have no doubt. If it succeeds, it's going to succeed despite the fact that it's horrible architecture. So what's going to happen is Google's going to make it succeed, and they're going to put it on the Android, and everybody's going to have to learn Dart and Fuchsia in order to play in the Android space. And I'm actually kind of glad that GPL three is causing people to do this because this is forcing them to make horribly stupid technical decisions. <laughs> And because of it, it's going to cause them. So there's a big debate about whether GPL3. Uh, so Apple's doing the same thing, right? Apple is pulling all of their GPL3. You can read all the stuff on this. This is why we have Z Shell instead of Bash. Was just one example. And so what's happening is that the 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 argument toward using a permissive license like MIT and Apache 2 and and BSD is has been, oh well, we'll contribute our things later. <laughs> Hopefully the Android phones will be will be polished enough when that happens. Who knows? Uh, not Android Linux. Hopefully the Linux phones. Yeah, I think so too. So so this is what's going down. So it's kind of fun to watch the whole macro thing, and that's that's kind of my thing. I, I sit back and combine a whole bunch of things together and make conclusions. And what looks like it's happening is that the GPL three has legs. I mean, it's like it's like scaring the shit out of these companies. <laughs> And I actually really like that. I really like that. I, I appreciate that much more now 
than I did before. I was like, okay, I'll do Apache 2. But, but now that I understand what that means, that means that the GPL2 has said, no, you really need to give your stuff back. And by the way, you can't lock down your operating system and say it can't be changed. That's GPL3. And what do they, what do they want to do with Android? The whole movement towards iPhone and Android is to encrypt the thing and make it so nobody can touch the operating system. They want to, they want to completely prevent jailbreaking. They, uh, there's no doubt. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind that that Google and Apple want full control of the devices. They want to take over those devices, and they want they want you to just basically rent the device from them and pay them three hundred dollars for it. So if you if you accept that that's their goal, then things like Fuchsia. The reason they're doing all this stuff is they want to put a little. They want to they want to send it with a chip, and if you mess with the operating system, they're going to void the warranty on the thing. And not only are they going to void the warranty, they're going to prevent that they're going to brick your device if you try to change anything, because the operating system is no longer going to match a checksum. And if for one second you don't think that Apple and Google is intent on doing that, you need to pause and rethink your position, because there's no doubt that's their financial intent and particularly for apple because apple's whole money income is now they have they had a four prong approach for making money they had app stores they had they had um you know they had itunes they had they had their 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 mac os product and then they had their iphone and now what do they have they have their iphone <laughs> it's like their biggest money maker and so if you think for a, for a second that they're not going to protect that investment with everything they have yeah so so that means these companies, these companies are like, oh fuck, GPL three. We can't. We we have. What do you mean we can't lock our devices down? So they are they are banishing GPL anything from all their system, and internally they're quietly adopting all of these these permissive license things so that they can lock them down. And they're not giving their changes back. Google's better than than Apple at giving their changes back and contributing back to the open source world, but Apple ain't. Apple just takes and takes and takes and doesn't ever give anything out. So this is actually why I'm laughing because this is this is the first time where they're going to fall on their face. Fuchsia is a total, total fail. I mean, it is a fail on every sense. It's done in C++. It requires Dart. They're not even, they're like saying, they might be able to use Ruby, but it's like in every sense, it's going to totally fail. And, and when it does, People are going to turn to, like you say, zeros. They're going to turn to Linux options that are GPL3 on Librem 5 phones. So you have this whole movement in the industry to say, no, we want our control of our devices. And what are they using? They're using Linux. Not only are they using Linux, they're using GPL3 Linux. So all of these Android phones, all of this openness, there's like this huge push in the industry to use all of this awesome software that the Linux community is putting out there. And meanwhile, these big behemoth companies who have so much hubris and so much pride and so much cluelessness are deciding, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to do our own thing and you're going to be forced to buy it anyway. And you're going to pay your 10 grand for this monitor stand and you're going to like it. <laughs> I know I'm ranting, but it's fun anyway. So... So this so what's happening is they're going to going to fail. They're going to fail. I have no doubt. And this eventually means iPhone unfortunately. So I mean it's going to take a while. But this future thing is dead before it even hits the, it hits the hits the it's the market. It is because they won't ever let it happen. The Android the Android ecosystem won't let it happen. People people have already given up on app stores. <laughs> PWA's killed app stores already. There's still a few people using it, but 30% of your income to Apple? No way. Those things are dead. Anyway. So I'm actually kind of happy to see that because that means that GPL3 is working, which means that the future of the internet is bright because that means that we're going to start to see more Linux-only devices and we're going to have more choice. And when as soon as we have more choice, the money will evaporate from the other options. You won't pay Google for your Android phone anymore. You won't pay Apple for your iPhone anymore. And when that money dries up, they're dead because they have built their entire operation around proprietary distinction. And you have to have this or you don't get anything else. Oh, there's my bill. And um, so I think it's wonderful because that means the GPL3 is working and that the internet is getting more open and that Google and Apple are going down. <laughs> They're going down. Um, our LinkedIn cybersecurity ecosystem continues to grow. Um, 
they're huge. It's going to take them a long time, just like it took IBM a long time to go down. Uh, cybersecurity 2002. Uh, cybersecurity, let's see here. Uh, am I over my time? I think I am over my time. Um, yep, I think I am, guys. Let me check my schedule. Let's see here. 12.30, I'm like way over my schedule. Gosh dang it, why didn't somebody say something? Stop me from ranting. 